Okay, let's get started. First, um, my, I'm subbing for my wife. Uh, she, uh, what's, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm subbing for my wife. She's uh, uh, had a little unexpected traveling today. So anyhow, uh, first like to welcome everybody. I uh, hope you all have a hop, happy Halloween. Uh, for those of you in the room, um, if you have a cell phone, we'd appreciate it if you would uh, turn it off or silence it before the, uh, actually it reminds me I need to do the same for my own. Um, and in terms of the folks from uh, on Zoom, uh, we uh, welcome you as well. And we also want to provide a special thank you to our uh, horse technician volunteer, Jenna Dieter, uh, who is a member of the Hope College uh, alum and family engagement team. Uh, if you've joined uh, the Haas virtual classroom as a participant uh, and have the skills, we're always looking for more uh, course technicians to help manage the technology. So if, um, if you have an interest, uh, if you don't have the skills, we'll train you, um, but uh, uh, we need some more volunteers. So if interested, please contact HASP at, at uh, HOPE.edu. Also, uh, tomorrow uh, is our monthly program. Uh, and so we'd like to invite you to uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, November 1st at 9.30 uh, in the Jack Miller Center for the Musical Arts. The presentation is titled, Why We Need President Ford Today, who is uh, presented by Gleaves Whitney, who is the Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford uh, Presidential Foundation. Coffee and cookies will be uh, served at nine o'clock. Uh, bring a friend, we hope to see you there. <clears throat> and one last reminder, we. Um, Please hold your comments or questions until somebody can approach you with a microphone so that everybody uh, that's participating can hear. So um, I have the pleasure to introduce Jerry Van Weingarten. Ever, most people in Haas know him. He was, a ha uh, he was a Haas president years ago. He has a master's in geography from the University of Minnesota, a master's in education from the University of Michigan. He's a specialist uh, in administration from uh, Michigan State. Who won yesterday? Oh, <laughs> we've got them both covered, don't you? Well, anyhow, um, uh, Jerry was a K through 12 teacher, uh, an administrator, part-time instructor at Hope College, Muskegon Community College, Grand Valley State University, Davenport University, and he was a superintendent uh, for Hamilton Community Schools. This is the second half of his presentation. This second session will be focused on Russia as it is today, cities, physical features, resources, and climate will all be covered. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Dave. Now, I was going to say <clears throat> his wife left him, but <laughs> that that may not sound right. <laughs> she had to go help their their daughter, so I guess that's <laughs> oh well. Well, <clears throat> uh, one comment before it: if you have a story or comment or whatever as we go along please interrupt go ahead because uh, that's part of it uh, i'd rather hear your story and see once what is there a connection to anything that we're doing here in russia we'd like to hear about it so okay well <clears throat> we'll see once whether i can get this correct today and that you have the right quizzes i I don't want uh, Ron to get after me again on having the wrong quiz, right? Uh, okay, well, let's see once. This morning I got an email from <clears throat> someone, and I'm trying to think of her name, but uh, on a subject that I did not know anything about, so I quickly researched it, and that'll come off here pretty soon, and I'll tell you when that is. It was, it happens to be the um, the location of the Jewish settlement, which I had not really researched before. <clears throat> so let's get going. If I can make this thing work, and it's not work, okay, work, work. There we go. There we go. There we go. I was pushing the wrong button. Okay. Well, plenty of glitz. Plenty of it. It's beautiful. St. Catherine and Peter Off, both of them have their own palaces 
and uh, they're still there and it's beautiful. If you, some of you may have had a chance to see these things and already uh, have a comment about them, but this is St. Catherine's. And then of course, Hermitage is the famous museum. There are six buildings to it. Five are open to the public. And some people will say, uh, hey, I would like, uh, I want to go to the Hermitage because I want to see the Amber Room. And um, I was not familiar with that particular one. I'm not sure that I saw the Amber Room when I was there. Saw a lot, of, a lot in there, but uh, uh, this is what it looks like. It is loaded with that kind of stone. It's beautiful. So it's famous for people to people around the world. Well, let's just go through a few of these things a moment. The Soviet leaders, which maybe I'll just refresh your memory of it, and we'll see Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Putin. Then. You stick them all in a in a bottle. I guess this is a nesting thing that you can put together. Uh, I've seen the nesting kinds of things, although not of this particular one. Now, does that do all of you know the people that are there? Can you recognize them immediately? Well, if you can't, I'll help you out. Okay. So you go right on down, all the way down to. Peter and Ivan Saint and Catherine, but you start with Yeltsin. You cannot uh, mistake Gorbachev, can you? He's always got that thing on his, uh, on his forehead. Okay. Well, <clears throat> switching down to religion just a minute, get a little feel for what Russia is like itself. Now, we've looked at all those um, extra people, extra countries last week and so now we're concentrating on just the area of russia itself and notice that yeah the re major religion if you look at the little inset there you will see that well, 45 percent are non-religious um so um 40, 46 or non, 45 percent are the Eastern Orthodox, and that seems to be the major religion throughout the, the Russia anyway. And you can see the other ones here as well, but quite a bit of Muslim, and quite a bit of Roman Catholic. There were a hundred churches before communism, and it's hard to find a hundred today. Most of those churches have either changed into museums or into some kind of a government. <clears throat> uh, facility. If you take a look at the Orthodox Church, which is the major one, you see where it's located mostly. The, the darkest uh, brown is where they have the most, of course. And that seems to be in the, well, you're talking about the Volga River Valley area. And um, so, Religion is kind of a minor thing for many of them, except those that are devout, re, but devoutly religious. And people <clears throat> from here uh, know quite a few people that were in from Ukraine and constantly are uh, talking to the people back there and their problems that they're having. So religion is important to many people, but not as important as you might think. Uh, Russian Orthodox, that's the basic one. <clears throat> but you also have the mosques nearby. And I put the word Kazan there because that's a town of sort of in the middle of the, San, the um, Siberian ra Railroad, where east of that, you are pretty well Muslim west of that would be Christian. So that's the, the kind of the dividing line. So that's why I have these two pictures there for that. 
But there are quite a few Lutheran, Roman Catholics of that particular stripe. Now, Russia is an immense territorial state. We looked at that last time. It's almost twice the size of the USA. Get a little picture here for a moment as to where it's important manufacturing wise. And as you can see, uh, there's a section around Moscow. There's a section around the Volga River Valley. And then there's a section along the Ural Mountains. We'll look a little bit at those. And then smaller ones toward the Siberian area. Um, the Karbas is a small one. And then the other one that's centered on Brask um, is rather important, but it's scattered. And then there's even a section of where they do some manufacturing out there in the, um, the, <clears throat> the Vladivostok area. So get a picture there. And now maybe this is why it's, the, it's located where it is. The tan, not the, the dark tan, I guess I'd have to say, is the area where you find oil and gas. And uh, the blue stripes is where they're still exploring for more of the same. You get a little idea where that's at. That's important to people in Russia because they can sell it and they need to sell it in order to exist. And that's where we, the uh, people in the support of Ukraine have decided not to buy their oil and gas. One of the problems is that <clears throat> they have a gas line running through the Baltic Sea that is, seems to be losing some of its methane, which at, as at this very moment, and they're struggling with that particular thing. Look at all the pipelines that are possible. They're coming out of Russia and serving Europe. That's why all the problem. This is where you would find where the oil is actually being produced. <clears throat> kind of follows that other map where you have the industry and the industrial business going. This is where you would find all the oil and gas reserves. Ah, well, it is the northernmost populous country in the world. And you will see, I have a few marks here that I have adjusted on some of the other slides. How many people are uh, 142 million, okay, are Russian. Uh, compare that to the United States, that figure is a little low right now, it's 308 million. They are located almost entirely, if you will, in the Western part of this country. And that's where you see most of the people. Um, very sparse all the way through Siberia. But <clears throat> it's the population is the seventh, seventh largest in the world. It's a big country and a lot of people. Giving a little idea, a little more exact feel as to how many people are there. In uh, 1950, they were running at 102 million. In 2000, they were 146 million. And then they lost some. And there is definitely a population decline. It is getting less. So uh, that's been happening, though, over the years, not just recently, but over the years. From 2000 to 20, in the last 22 years, in effect, they keep losing population. And the big question is, well, why? Well, possible reasons for the decline. Uh, high death rate due to heart disease and accident or mass privatization with unemployment and suffering. Okay. Widespread use of alcohol. Leading to early, which leads to early death. Too much vodka, I guess. 
In fact, if you go to Russia and one of the entering drinks uh, you are served is vodka. Life expectancy for males is 62, for females is 64. And if you look at that at a little chart next to it, the peak is in, the, in um, about 19, about 2000. And then at the decline is very apparent in that one that's sliding on down this way. So they're having trouble with population. Why? <clears throat> Skilled Russians know that their skill is in demand across the world. And so they leave, leaving what we would call then ghost villages. Some just leave to colder climes, even in the Siberia, just to get out of the uh, rat race of uh, what the communists have had that. And now what the new ol oligarchs have taken over, Putin and so forth, they would like to get out of that <clears throat> yoke, so to speak. A hundred and thirty different ethnic groups. You know, we have a lot of different different ethnic groups here, but tend to be more with uh, taking English into consideration. But here you have at least one hundred and thirty different ethnic groups, and they don't always get along the best. But the biggest group is Russian. That's the 10 on there. Quite a few Turks, and that's the red part of it. And then several others as well. Russia <clears throat> has just a few seaports. And they're constantly trying to do something about it. And last time we talked about Kaliningrad as being one of those that they really wanted. So let's just take a look at these. And uh, you see the arrows uh, showing where they are, and I'll sh cover each one of them here in a moment. So we'll start here with um, Kaliningrad, and you already know about that from last week. Kaliningrad was a very important to them because it was on the Baltic Sea, and they could get uh, large uh, shipments to come in at that point, much, much more so than St. Petersburg which was in a more of a shell or, shell or part of the, the sea. So this exclave you saw last week, just to remind you that it's there and it's uh, part of old Lithuania that the Russian government decided to carve out into a new part, Kaliningrad, I think had quite a bit to do with the Germans at one time and the Polish. Uh, later on. So uh, they just kind of took that over as their major um, important seaport. So <clears throat> as Russia needed uh, ice-free ports, uh, Kaliningrad remained a part of Russia. The port is connected to them, Russia by going through Lith Lithuania. So they got to keep getting along with Lith Lithuania to let them do that. Here are some of the connections that they use. A picture of Kaliningrad's seaport, rather extensive. And I think I showed you this last time, the major headquarters for Russia is here for their seaport. Then let's move to a different one, this time to St. Petersburg, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. This one here, it's hard for me to see this. Yeah, you can see where St. Petersburg is. Now, St. Petersburg was an important port. Um, in fact, Peter the Great decided that was really a very important seaport for him. <clears throat> so he built that up. That's a little bit better picture of it. Then I didn't need, need that arrow. It is there still their main seaport. The port, and a picture of what they are doing at the port. It's one of the major, major container ports on the Baltic Sea. And this is, they use this as a breaking point 
bulk point to spread the containers around mostly down the railway out to the Volga and to Moscow and so forth. Now, another one is up there in the colder regions, Murmansk. Murmansk is way in the far north, and so it should be full of ice year round because it's that far north in the Barents Sea but it is not. Why? Because the Gulf Stream comes up around Norway and is warm enough to keep Vermont's ice free. But if you go a little bit further to the next one, which is Archangel, then it does freeze up every year. But Vermont's remains ice free. So that they use as a rather important container point too. And notice that they can reach the interior of Russia by that means. Russia would love to have some more uh, ice-free ports, but <clears throat> uh, you can see where Murmansk is at this point. And maybe that's a familiar one to you. Uh, <clears throat> it is on the, uh, on the Barrett Sea, picture of it there. How many of you remember this one? What? Well, sure, a few of you do, because it's quite a few years ago. Kursk was a nuclear submarine that suffered an explosion in the Barrett Sea. Okay, it hit the news as of August the 12th, 2000. And uh, gives you a little idea where it went down, but it was not that far from Murmansk. They asked somebody to pick it up if they would. And so <clears throat> a group from the Dutch came over and pulled this, mer this Kursk submarine up. Leak of hydrogen peroxide in the torpedo exploded the thing and it hit bottom, de detonating other tor torpedo warheads. And as a consequence, every one of them died 118. The Dutch recovered the Kursk a year later. They, why the Russians didn't do it, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe they weren't uh, able to, but they finally allowed the Dutch to come on. Go ahead, uh, Ron. Uh, he's, you gotta, there we go, say it again. They don't have the uh, sea going equipment to actually haul it up. There's only a couple of this, most of them out of Netherlands, one the Smith Tack, and they're the ones that hauled that up. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Pam, did you want to talk to? <laughs> okay, all right. But so you, uh, so, so many of you remember that, I would imagine. Uh, Murmansk. Well, on that same peninsula, <clears throat> is the Kola Peninsula. <clears throat> There's a super deep borehole there. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, still scratchy. <clears throat> so they began to build, dig there for scientific reasons. And they reached 40,000 feet below. Well, which surpassed the one at uh, Qatar. Uh, the oil well there. And so um, supposedly it was supposed to be the deepest and it was there for the purposes of scientific inquiry. What's down there anyway? Well, this super hole, borehole, uh, they did find out, which they were surprised about, that they um, there was no evidence that granite did run out and it to basalt, basalt. And they figured that the center of the earth has more basalt in it. And so they're still looking at that and that's still a mystery to them at this point, as far as I know anyway. So <clears throat> yeah, there's the super deep hole. How about that? Okay. They like to, seem to like to deep, uh, 
deep bore holes. Remember the one of the, the diamonds earlier? Thank you, Dave. Get rid of that little scratch here. Thank you much. That was good. <clears throat> so that's the Kola Peninsula. Another picture of it, 7.6 miles deep, trying to find out a few things for science. They weren't after any uh, minerals or anything at this point, just simply pure science. Uh, Russians like to seem to <clears throat> like to deep dig holes. So on the Antarctica, where they have a station, they went through the ice, two and a half miles through the ice. Uh, and if you see the small little map there where Lake Victoria is, or Vostok, I'm sorry, Lake Vostok, that, that lake is 2.2 miles underneath the ice. They were able to dig down in there, hoping to find uh, maybe some prehistoric life, but they didn't. So now, what happens if there sh could be some global warming? The Arctic Ocean ports, Russia would like to develop. Here are some names. Murmansk is on there again, but others that if it would just warm up a little bit, they could have other ports on the Arctic Ocean that they could get around. And <clears throat> as things start to warm up, they are finding that to be the case. That, that's, that it would be a possible thing. So Russia is very interested in the area of the Arctic Ocean. And if you take a look at this one, uh, notice that the red line is the 200 mile, nautical mile distance from the various countries. So when you're that close, the country that it's close to, of course, rules that part of it. Well, at the top there, of course, is Russia, and it is exceeding the red line all the way to the North Pole. <clears throat> and they they have named uh, the major ridge in the North at the uh, Arctic Ocean, the Lomonosov um, Ridge, and the, we'll see in a moment who he is. But they decided that, well, why not they why not have the North Pole be a part of themselves, Russia? So what happens? <clears throat> in the corner there, you will see that uh, in 2007, the Russians planted a titanium flag under the North Pole. Okay, and when we were look, study the Arctic floor, we talked about this one too, how they wanted to have that North Pole. Well, maybe that would be one way. Put your stake up there. Now, not everybody, I think, is too happy about this, which would be illustrated by this one. Uh -huh. At any rate, here's the guy, <clears throat> and he is quite an important Russian scientist. So he has his name plastered on a number of places there, including the University of Moscow. And he even has a polar bear cub named after him. How about that? Well, down below, or south, I should say, of Murmansk, is Archangel. Archangel is a, an active port, and it works good as long as the ice does not form. So the summertime, it works quite well. Uh, a very large city, as far as that's concerned. Very nice city, as far as it, you, uh, if you ever can, can visit it. But it's cold. It's a container port on the White Sea. So it's a very modern type of buildings that they 
uh, have been able to successfully support. And one of their ice sculptures, which lasts a long time. So, but it does melt every year. So, <clears throat> well, Nova Ferrosic is a port on the Black Sea. Well, the Black Sea is in trouble today, of course, uh, with the Crimea and the like, but at least that's an open port for them. And if you want to take a quick look down the Black Sea uh, and get all the way to Egypt, where well, you can through that particular method, uh, to the Dardanelles. So they like to maintain that particular port as well, very much so. It's a pretty important port for them. I'm having trouble with it anyway today because of the uh, Ukraine's we're able to <clears throat> destroy at least a couple of the ships in the in the uh, Russian Black Sea. Now, way over on the other side of the country is Vladivostok. It's across from Nordhukda, access to the sea of Japan, but it is also icebound. So as a consequence, it's seasonal. <clears throat> it, I have a picture here of the aging fleet. It's near Sakhalin and Kamkatchka. Uh, maybe some of these two terms, Sakhalin and Kamkatchka, might trigger some kind of remembrance on your part. But <clears throat> Sakhalin particularly uh, was in the news when the, Oh, I think it was a South Korean commercial airplane was shot down by the Russians, and that really raised a big fuss about 20 years ago. Taking a look <clears throat> here after World War II, the Navy feet, uh, fleet of the United States came into Vladivostok and um, joined the Russian fleet there for a little bit. But <clears throat> as you can see, you have um, the peninsula uh, Kamkatchka uh, is in one place and Sakhalin is in the other. Kamkatchka and Sakhalin. So, this is their port. And they have some modern uh, vessels in there today and use it as their outlet toward uh, the Pacific Ocean. However, they seem to have an aging fleet, and this is what's, what that looks like. Maybe a couple of new ships, uh, generally speaking, pretty old uh, and not doing too well. I guess you have to be an oligarch to own a proper yacht or whatever it is. Not, not like this, anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Let's get a little picture of it. And if you notice the red line, it's supposed to be the main line, and it goes all the way down through um, from Petersburg, but it actually goes through part of China at this point. So as a consequence, if they don't like to go through China, then they built a separate one to go around to get to Vladivostok. But <clears throat> they didn't include Moscow in that, in that one, so they made sure that they put this green uh, trail in as part of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Uh -huh. St. Petersburg train station, they have really very nice looking train stations and they're very proud of their, their train stations to keep them uh, up to snuff and they try to keep them uh, have some type of beauty about them. The train accommodations here are really pretty good. And if you want to take a trip on, you know, the, the coaches 
uh, are really quite nice to travel in. So one of the pictures of the Moscow station, clean as a whip, you don't say, see any trash of any kind. Now, I think I mentioned Gazan before. The Christian religion it tends to be west of Gazan, and uh, Islam is east of it. So here you have a couple of pictures of the mosque on the east side. Nova, Nova Vosibrix is one of their major cities, as well as it. Yet Tackenberg is another important one. I murdered I murdered it. You got it, Lee? Kettersburg. Oh, Kettersburg. you got it, Kettersburg? Kettersburg? Okay, okay. I'll take that. Train, uh, Siberian Railway uh, has to negotiate some rather interesting, difficult terrain. And that's one of the pictures that it has to, that shows that. Uh, at one particular point in your ask, uh, the um, pipeline seems to be crossing the Yenisei River. And at least they have some kind of a pleasure with it. They have some bungee jumping cooking on this particular one. So it's only 144 feet. So if you'd like to do that, no, nobody wants to do that. Back into history a little bit is 2012. Finally, this guy was released from prison. He was a scientist that <clears throat> spent 14 years sentenced for selling secrets to China. And that's kind of just an example of what they were doing at that particular time. Erkantz is a rather important town in cold Siberia. And we'll see once what some of the people did over there. Uh, Olin Oti is also a rather interesting little town with its native people in costume there showing up. But Erkantz is near Lake Baikal, which we should talked about before. It's a rather important part of that whole uh, complex. So back to Vladivostok as the end of the Siberian Railway. We'll come back to some more of this. Okay. <clears throat> Russian dimensions. Ah. Twice the size of US or China. Siberia, known as the sleeping giant, sleep, sleeping land, spans 11 time zones. The Gulf of Finland, all the way to Alaska, west to east. Now, let's see if I can point this out from where I'm standing, which is not a very good place to see it. So I'll stand over here a little bit and watch this. If it's two o'clock at this region, so 11 time zones, three o'clock in this one, four o'clock in this small little area here, five o'clock in this area uh, uh, into S Siberia. And here we go with, six o'clock down here for this portion, seven o'clock in here, eight o'clock for this small portion, nine o'clock for this one, 10 o'clock here, 11 o'clock, and finally you get noon. 11 different time zones. Try to travel that, if you will. Or if you are an important person like Putin and you want to make a speech to all the people over there in Russia, you got to time it so that it's not at night any place. Uh, how do you do that? Well, good question. But it's a big one. The climate is rather restrictive for any growth for agriculture. 
short growing seasons and a drought quite often. They have uh, their problems with that. And not only that, but quite a bit of erosion, taking the good land away. Actually, they have snow melt over there. Do we have snow melt? Yeah, well, I guess they use the sun as snow melt, don't they? <laughs> uh, not Holland. The, let's see, the green area there. Try to imagine that as being part of the United States. That is very similar to our temperature and our climate, the green area. Uh, in <clears throat> the stretches, of course, to Moscow on down into the, in the center. But it would be very much like um, our Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio area, all the way to um, the New York area. So if you can imagine that, <clears throat> what would they grow over there uh, would be very similar to what we could grow in our, in our area. But <clears throat> look at the, what's that, the purple area, purple, purple, gray, whatever it is. Um, it's just plain cold. It is <clears throat> considered subarctic. And then, of course, way on the top, you find the tundra itself. Uh, gets a little idea. Well, during the time of communism, collective farms <clears throat> were organized, of course, under Stalin. And that effect is still affecting the people today in a different way. Because now it's become a private ownership, mostly by big corporations or single oligarchs or single people. But at least at one time, they did have this cooperative kind of arrangement. <clears throat> and today you will find the grain, the, the companies can harvest grain very much like they would you in the United States. And of course, the Ukraine is probably the biggest area for that kind of work, but not only there, but into Belarus and so forth since Ukraine is, hmm, is not dealing with them right now. So, but it's rather important to them with these large farms. You do find a few little farms. Here's a private farm, a picture of a private farm. Um, um, we happen to visit, visit one of the private farms of a person that was, Going, was cooperating with our tour group. And um, she was one of the teachers in the school system there. And uh, was very happy to have tour groups like this come in, partly because um, they gave them a little bit of money. And she was very proud of the fact that the tour group money that came in for her allowed her to buy a refrigerator and a stove. So you see, maybe that's an indication as to where they are at in, in that particular thing. This is in contrast. Wow. The Velde Selene, my Duchess, um, the, Dutch, the Duchess, are between St. Petersburg and Moscow, and the rich live very well. And I don't know how well you can see this on there, but all of those are super nice homes, uh, really mansions in many ways. That's where the rich live, okay? At least some of them do. And they play in that river that's next to it all summer long until it freezes over. Now, Putin has his only dacha. Okay, the filthy rich, Putin's lifestyle includes only four yachts, 58 aircraft, 
or his personal use. Putin's wealth is about 69 billion. It's probably more than that figure now. I'm not sure how much that, but it's a lot. All right, he's got a, uh, a dacha there, but he has uh, a few more. Oh, here's one more of his 20 different homes. Okay. You can go all over the country and find his own dacha. Ooh, what happened here? Uh, how did that did how did that sneak in, Janet? Oh, another one snuck in. <clears throat> there are two kinds of people, aren't there? All right. I guess what's next? Do I have it correct this time? <clears throat> All right. I'll just zip through those a minute. <clears throat> number one is easy. Number two is jig. Number three is dog. Number four is how. Number five is love. Number six is Charlie. Number seven is Mike. Number eight is Nan. Number nine is Baker. Number 10 is Oboe. Number 11 is George. Number 12 is Abel. And, uh, and number 13 is King. And 14 is Fox. All right. And everyone got them all right, right? Okay. You didn't have the right one? You didn't want to pick one up? Oh. Oh, is that the wrong one up there? There's extra quizzes and maps um, by the coffee. That's yeah, where they were located. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, we got another quiz coming up. So maybe you gotta pick one up. See if we can find one there. Okay. Well, let's see. Further information on Russia. <clears throat> They're divided into various parts, and if you flip your map, probably it will be uh, on the other side of it. The Russian plane, the, um, th that's the major core area. Moscow is the center, it's the primate city. The primate city is the most important one, just like New York is the primate city for the United States. It is the primate city for Russia. It extends from the Kola Peninsula to the Caucasus Mountains in that particular, and you can see that on the map as it zips on down. And that should be on your, the yellow side of your map, okay? Like that, okay? That's number one. So we'll look at that for just a little bit. Once again, we are talking about St. Petersburg. It's called a forward capital. Why? Because um, Peter the Great says, look, we got to have an, a, an outlet to, to the West. And the best place for that is right there on the Baltic Sea. Okay, let's just build a city there, which they did. First, it was Leningrad, uh, but he built it into Peter's, St. Petersburg. So it's called a forward city because it's looking toward the West for um, information and the like. <clears throat> there are some countries that build their capital as a forward city. <coughs> such as um, Brazil built its 
capital inland quite a ways called Brasilia uh, as a forward city because he, they wanted to encourage people to move toward the end of the center and away from Rio de Janeiro. So this is supposedly a forward city that it makes the contact out to the west. And the people that they wanted to contact at this point, at least Peter, uh, St. Peter, not Peter, <laughs> Peter the Great, uh, uh, he, uh, he wanted to get a hold of the Dutch. The Dutch had good information on shipbuilding and the like and various um, techniques that he wanted to use in Russia. So that was one of the major region, reasons why he built St. Petersburg. It is known as a forward capital. By the way, it's on the river. The back side of the Hermitage Museum is facing the Neva River. Let's see it, whether we can see anything here. St. Petersburg has the Hermitage. It's a beautiful building. And Catherine's place is nearby. Here's Moscow's business center. Uh, we're away from the St. Petersburg now. The business center is, uh, of course, the, the most important one. It's the lead city as far as Russia is concerned. Take a look where the Moscow government buildings are. And maybe we can find out on this next place. Interesting enough, Moscow, <clears throat> if you take the temperature of, for a year at Moscow and do the same thing for Minneapolis, they are virtually the same. As you can see, it runs about the same all the way across. A dead ringer. So you get a little feel as to what kind of climate they do have there if you have ever lived in Minneapolis. Minneapolis is cold. I, since I lived there a year, I realized that very pleasant place. Now, back to Moscow, the Kremlin. <clears throat> One there. <coughs> One arrow shows the where the Kremlin is in relation to the river. And Red Square is right next to it. In the next picture, maybe we can see a picture of that. Uh, if you can remember this particular map. And then let's look at that. There's the Kremlin. And next to it, right next to it is, uh, okay, Kremlin. And here is the Red Square, Red Square and St. Basil's Church. Okay, get a little feel for Moscow itself. Again, a little closer picture of that and St. Basil's along with the Kremlin. They have a very good transportation system as far as rails, railroads, and so forth are concerned in Moscow. Again, we see that they have pretty well decorated them up so that they look nice. Now, the, an example of what they use the um, free area for. They love parades, especially with um, big armed units as well as soldiers. We move on now to Euro Mountains. It's a 20, um, it's a 2000 mile long strip all the way from the Arctic down to the south part, really up to Kazakhstan. So it's, it's fairly high range, except for some area in the middle. And if you look on this map where it says Central Urals, seems to be a pretty good place to cross. It's a little lower in that area. So, and that map is shown in this one as well, the central area. They, uh, it allows the railroads to cross at that particular point and the highways and the like with, with relative ease. 
Now, out in the central Urals, the people that live there, uh, yeah, they have very simple villages and a very simple kind of life and seem to flourish okay in that regard. Hungary is one of the cities in that particular area on the river. The Ural forests and minerals have been the basis for industrialization and boast at least uh, 20 different commercially usable minerals. Platinum is a big one. Antrotite and beryl are of less importance, but they're still there. Okay, Russia produces 14% of the world's platinum. Rather important contribution to the world. The Southern Urals are wider and consist of a number of parallel north-south ridges in intervening valleys and the like. Okay. Now we move on to West Siberia Plain. That's number three on your map. <clears throat> and two cities that we, one of them we've already mentioned, but uh, Amask is the other one. They're important on the um, area of that particular West Siberian Plain, but Siberian is cold. Uh, just a picture. Notice the, where this river is going. The river <clears throat> leads up into the Arctic and so flows north. It, a mosque seems to be a railroad hub for the north-south branches of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Okay. And it is the most popular, third most popular city in Russia. So it's quite significant in the Russian the picture, as far as that's concerned, the third most populous. And in this particular place, <clears throat> the nuclear physics founded in 1959, <clears throat> most, <clears throat> most involved in military, concentration on high energy physics, plasma physics, and particle physics developed first particle accelerator in the world, collided two beams of particles. There's a big one of those located near Chicago too. The town of Akrader Makradok near Nova Vosibursk is, is, is the location of the Bud Kerr Institute of Nuclear Physics developed electron cooling in 68, employs 3,000. The Budker Institute is in the, this particular building, nuclear, psychic, physic, nuclear physic. The West Siberian plain is poorly drained. It has some of the world's largest swamps and floodplains. Hmm. And notice this is not very high above sea level about 330 feet, lower than we are here for sure. And this is part of the Yenisei River Basin heading on toward the Arctic Ocean. The, have a few nomads here. I show this particular picture because the nomads themselves are very friendly with their animals. Very friendly. Yeah, because that's their life. They have to, that's the only way they can live. And they use the reindeer at the particular point. Now, at Novosibirsk, I note this because December 19, 2012. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago. It was 20 below at that particular time there. Two circus elephants were nearly killed by the cold. Well, this guy here is pictured. How do you save the elephants? 
he finally figured out how. The handler bought two cases of vodka, mixed the vodka with warm water, served it to the elephants. They roared and became very happy. Well, one way to use that. Moving on. Uh, at least they was noteworthy enough to make the news. Here, <clears throat> the central Siberian plateau is sparsely settled, inaccessible, restrictive climate, and permafrost. What's with this permafrost? Well, it's a nice, big, broad plain on its way to the Arctic. But the permafrost is very definitely a problem with it, and it is emitting methane constantly. This particular diagram does show at least a little bit of how that works. The methane is constantly coming, being emitted there. And by the way, the, uh, in the Baltic Sea, the pipeline that goes underneath the water in the Baltic Sea is having a little bit of a problem. And as of today, it's still emitting some methane coming, leaking out of it. So methane is a problem in many different places. But here it is certainly the case because the atmosphere, as it warms, uh, the, the permafrost starts to melt or more of it melts, let's put it that way, and releases more methane. And methane is a real problem for us as far as global warming is concerned. It works both ways. Permafrost, maybe this looks like a chunk of permafrost, the hedge that is on the top of it. <clears throat> uh, it releases, methane is released from melting permafrost 23 times more potent than carbon dioxide. But that's also true in the North America as far as that's concerned. So it's not only there. In warm weather, permafrost prevents the drainage, can't go any place. And yet those rivers go toward the north. In the Yakursk area, you find the, the high relief mountains and the Lena River. Now notice where the Lena River is going. Uh, it is covered with ice most of the time, not all the time. <clears throat> but if you're down here where the little arrow shows you, uh, at your curse, you can travel all the way to the Arctic Ocean. However, you will be traveling on ice. It's cold. By the way, I put this picture in here because furs are much better at pre uh, preventing you your cold than wool. Wool tends to uh, mat up with your your own perspiration, but furs do not, and so they are uh, well equipped with furs in the area of the Siberia, the Lena River. Let's see if I can find any more of it, but it's going on up there. The Lena River at, yeah, your cuts is frozen most of the year. No bridge crosses the Lena, nothing. Crossing depends on frozen ice. So here you go. You smooth it out a little bit and go on the road, but it is ice. It works. Lena River has some nice scenery, the pillars there. But Here's a picture of the Trans-Siberian Road near your cuts. And as a consequence, you see lots of snow and the problem that they have with, uh, yeah, trying to keep the, the road free enough so they can travel on it. Here again, we've got permafrost. So what do they do? They make sure that they build by uh, above the permafrost by putting down concrete pillars down to where it, there's no permafrost. And dig very deep to make sure that the 
buildings do not sag and do not lean over and whatever. Yeah. If they didn't do that, they definitely would have buildings that would be uh, slant and the like. But they have some pretty good, nice buildings in this particular town. Theater is rather important to them for some good reasons, which we'll see in a moment. The Let's move on back to this time, the Eastern Highlands, uh, and also the, the Kamchatka Peninsula and the Sakhalin Island. The volcano is in uh, South Kamchatka, whichever, which uh, emits every so often, and you may hear about that on the news. The Eastern Islands, uh, has ridges and valleys and the like, and a for volcanic and of course Lake Baikal. And they also have something called the Siberian cranes. Interestingly enough, the Siberian cranes have a trip every, every summer or every winter to go south and then they come back. Well, there were several uh, cranes raised from eggs, and these cranes didn't know where to go. So this happened also with a similar bird in the United States. Somebody got into a rig and led them to the south, flew with them. Guess who did that over here? Putin got into one of these things, and he raised the captivity. Uh, cranes and he followed their natural navigation routes and he flew in this whatever that is. Okay, and there you find a couple of the tracks that go south for the cranes. Well, what else do they have there? Ah, brown bear, Siberian tiger. Uh-huh, and a different tiger, the Amur tiger, and also Amur leopard. In this particular region, the Kolama region, you will find gold and uh, permafrost in a town called Magadan. It still has, it's fairly good size at 99,000. It was a forced labor camp for Stalin for many years. And that they named one of the streets Lenin. And this particular area, here's a house in Sakhalin and Kamkachka, the constant um, yeah, eruptions that occur there every so often. Opala is the volcano, volcano that's doing that. Here we have a little problem with Japan, which was solved during World War II. Japan claims the Curly Islands. Russia was given the islands after World War II. And in 1951 San Francisco peace talks, Japan gave up all claims to the islands, but Russia does not have sovereignty. And as you can see on the map, where those disputed islands happen to be. They, they seem to be at a stalemate there and not doing very much about it. Not too important to them. But it is right on the edge of the Pacific plate, as you can see. And if they're pushing against the Eurasian plate, there's bound to be a volcanic activity. And as you can see where that's happening in these islands. Well, we're switching way back now to Central Asian range which happens to be in the high mountains. Ah, so as a consequence, there is uh, a, a snow line. Of course, it's, as a consequence, it's, it's a glaciated area in these higher mountains. The Altai range with its uh, Baluka mountain at this particular spot. So it's fairly high there. So the Altai Mountain is the source of the Ob and 
Ertes rivers, which flow north into the Arctic Ocean eventually, but across Siberia, even though it originates here in these mountains, so very far south. And that gives you a picture as to where that might be. <clears throat> now we're going to look at Urkuts Ir again. We've been there before. Let's look at them again. It's a rather nice looking town. There's the train station and also a cathedral. Not very far from China, as you can see, or Mongolia, if you will. That part of it, that's a separate, is separate uh, that from China, but it's still a very important part of China. The Erkurs Assembly of Nobility in 1900s, that has quite a bearing on this, on this particular town. In the early 19th century, <coughs> many Russian artists, officers, and nobles were sent into exile. Where did they go? into Siberia. Well, where in Siberia? It happened to be Irkuts. Or there, they had to be sent there because of their, what they called the Decembrists revolt against Nicholas I. And so being over there, they used their skills very, because they were so talented, many of them, to uh, have a very, really quite a nice life because they could invent things very well became the center of the intellectual and social life for these exiles and much of the city's cultural heritage comes from them. Many of the wooden houses <clears throat> adorned with ornate hand carved decorations <clears throat> survive today in stark contrast with the standard Soviet apartment blocks that surround them. Maybe you recognize this, those blocks which the Soviets made for years as ugly apartment buildings. By the end of the 19th century, there was one exiled man for every two locals. Mm -hmm. People of varying backgrounds from the members of the Decembrist uprising of, of Bolsheviks have been in accursed for many years and have greatly influenced the culture and the development of the city. As a result, Urkus eventually became a prosperous cultural and educational center in eastern Siberia. And there is the house of the scientists there. Urkus is the location of a rather important hydroelectric dam. It's not too far from Lake Baikal. And notice this Yenisei River with the branch of Ankara. And car runs through Brask and um, eventually er occurs, and then in, as a source, a little bit of it anyway, from Lake Baikal. They have electric, hydroelectric dams. Here's Brask. Brask is an invention <clears throat> of Stalin way back. He wanted them to really produce something important out in that part of the country. So their decision was to have some type of manufacturing in the Far East. Ah, hydroelectric power was available. Okay. Bauxite was available. Yeah. What do you do with bauxite? Well, you make aluminum. It is, a, it is cold, but wages were higher there than in, elsewhere in the Soviet Union. So people were attracted to go to Brodsk. And it's not such a bad looking city, as you can see. But it, even if it is cold and out there, here was their big aluminum smelter. And the dam that they used needed for the manufacturing of it to provide the power and the plant where they made aluminum. The other day, the um, United States once again decided that they would not want any of this aluminum from there. 
because they, uh, they would just simply feed the Russians more money. So they put a ban on all the aluminum from this particular town. October 12, 2020, 2022, just recently. Well, we're still moving around on your yellow paper. This time it's the Caucasus Mountains, and we're down number eight. Extension, it's, that is an extension of the Alpines. And notice that here we have a country called Dagestan, as well as Azerbaijan, which we already uh, talked about. But we didn't talk about Dagestan and Chesna, those two there before. Those have their own kind of interesting stories. The Russians had very difficult time controlling those. They were 90% Muslim and they were not too cooperative with the Russian people even today. So as a consequence, the Russians tended to leave them a little bit alone because they were too hard to fight with. They did a lot of fighting with the those in Chesna for a couple of years and they decided it wasn't worth it all. As a consequence, I have some pictures here of the people who ruled the place in Dagestan. They happen to be mostly women and they are in their uh, parliament or whatever you want to call their judge, their department that uh, rules the country and they get along all right with Russia at this point. And here is one of the pictures of the people that are in the ruling um, part of Dagestan. Dagestan represents many, many ethnic groups and they're Muslim, so they're in control. Not a very appealing mountainside, if you will. We're gonna live in that kind of situation. No wonder the Russians said, hey, you just live by yourself because it's not worth it to go in there and get killed for that purpose. But they do have a pretty nice building for their parliament, 121 de deputies, 33 languages. However, the business language is Russian. Two wars from Russia to keep Chesna in Russia. Well, they destroyed a lot and they finally gave up and they had somewhat of a truce in that particular area. We must be ready for a quiz. Could that be? Uh, now, which one are you? I'm not talking about the dog or the bird. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I have the right one now. Seem to match? It's the first one, Moscow? All right. <clears throat> 15 is King. 16 is George. I got the wrong one. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Thank you, thank you for straightening me out again. Uh, I do remember doing that. <laughs> uh, so, 17 is dog, or the other way around. Yeah, king or dog. Okay. 18 is how, 19 is love. 20 is Charlie, 21 is Mike, 22 is Permafrost, 23 is Nan, 24 is Oboe, 25 is Abel, 26 is Fox, 27 is Peter, 28 is Jig, 
and 29, easy. Well, any um, question? Any questions that I can't answer, or comments that you want to make, of having been in one of those towns or somewhere along the line? Okay. Well, I appreciate your kind attendance. Oh, we have one. Oh, okay. That's great. You know, whenever you hear of uh, Russia, it seems to be like it's all in the western part of the country and like the eastern part is like mysterious. Is that kind of how uh, you view Russia as the most important active part is around Moscow and the rest of the country is just cold. Yeah, I would agree with you with that. The, um, the European part, maybe that's the easiest way to say that, is, is the most active part uh, that we hear about. Uh, of course, that's where Moscow and St. Petersburg are. The others are, you don't see very much of the, like Lake Baikal or, or uh, Bratsk and the, and the like. And only only when something like happens when you, they have to cancel the uh, aluminum uh, that you hear about it. That was in the paper this uh, you know, very recently. So, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Jerry, can you refresh me on the succession, Catherine and Peter? I'm trying to recall. Um, the succession in, in, Let's in Russia. See. Well, Peter came after uh, after Catherine. Let's see. Do I? Have, oh, you. My original little ones way on the top there. Is that what you had in mind? Uh huh. I I do not know the yeah uh, the pattern very well on that. Let's see if I can get back to the to the the front of this. Uh huh. Since this is not my computer, I'm not sure how to work it. Uh huh. How do I get back to the beginning, Dave, of my presentation? <laughs> that didn't work either. Maybe I messed it all up. So, oh yeah, okay. Now, now if we go down one, no, that doesn't answer your question, though. Now, the next one, that might help a little bit. See the last ones there? That makes any sense? <laughs> okay. Now, we have a question online. Um, okay. Why was Leningrad name changed to St. Petersburg? That's kind of simple because Peter the Great decided that was better for him to be acknowledged. So he, he wanted his name in that particular place rather than Lenin. And uh, well, he changed it back to Petersburg. Okay. Leningrad. They, uh, I think it started out as Petersburg, and then became Leningrad. Yeah, it was. And it was Saint Petersburg. Okay, there you go. Then when the uh, Soviet took over and Lenin was in charge of things, they changed it to Leningrad. Okay. And then when Lenin fell out of popularity and was chased out and everything, then they changed okay. it back to Saint Petersburg. Okay. I knew Lee would have the answer. Okay. 
One more question. Do I remember reading about Lake Bacall and um, drops in the water level? And does that affect those hydroelectric dams in that area? No, um, Lake Bacall really doesn't affect the, the, the dams. The dams are before, uh, no, it is true that if there would be a drop in Lake Bacall's level, they probably wouldn't get as much. That's very, that's, but I have not heard that Lake Bacall has dropped at all in any, any amount of uh, water in it, because what goes into Lake Baikal, Baikal uh, is small rivers and that hasn't been used that much. It's different than rivers than other places like the Colorado River, which is being used before it gets there, or the rivers that go into uh, Aral, the Aral uh, Sea. The Aral, the Aral Sea is the one that's drying up. That's the one that's drying. Mm -hmm. Aral, the Aral, the Aral, Aral Sea. sea. The ROC has dropped and, over 40 feet. And it's and it's dropped because they decided they wanted to grow cotton with the water. So the water never got to the ROC. It's not getting to the ROC. Two rivers, Dur Duria and Duria. They have both the same name with uh, another preface to it, each one. They are coming through in Uzbekistan into Oro Lake, and they just virtually took all the water and put it into the desert and grow cotton. Um, and I have a, it's a comment from the beginning of the lesson. Thank you so much. I always learn a lot from your classes. Thank you. Um, the population, as far as losing population, yeah. I read somewhere, I can't, can't quote for sure. I read so many things. Could have been in Time or Magazine, maybe, um, that... Putin is now going to reward men who have at least five children. I don't know how much they get, but pushing for that kind of population sure. explosion. Well, um, how many ladies are moving to Russia? <laughs> what? <laughs> what, did you, what did you say too late? <laughs> We were just in uh, Budapest two weeks ago, and Hungary, I'm told, has four kids, no income tax for life for the women, but the men still get taxed. Ah. Uh, oh, okay. Well, hey, we're getting some nice tidbits here. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Hey. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate all you people who are on virtual, too. I hope that you could get most of this. And thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jerry. It was another fabulous class. I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Pleasure.